another session in the online 2021 student development workshop. I'm Mariette Haka, I'm the chair of the council. With me today is my fellow council member, Mpumi Moringa. Hi, Mpumi. Hi. And our special guest presenter for today is Nicole Hoffman. And uh, Nicole is currently the museum interpretive officer at the University of Pretoria Museums. Uh, which is responsible for the public engagement of museum audiences with regard to the university's institutional art and heritage collections and attracting cultural tourism to the UP museums. Moreover, she is responsible for the interpretation of the exhibitions in the museum galleries and the sculpture route on Hatfield campus by means of hybrid learning initiatives by leading physical guided and educational tours and offering virtual tours and presentations of the UP collections to the diverse visitors of the UP museums. On the educational front, Nicole is currently working on her PhD in religious studies uh, with a focus on biblical archaeology at UNISA's Department of Biblical and Ancient Studies, whereby she studies and investigates uh, the looting and destruction of archaeological heritage in the Near East. So moreover, she holds an undergraduate uh, and honours and a master's degree in heritage and cultural tourism from the University of uh, Pretoria, from their Department of Historical and Heritage Studies and the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology, as well as an honours degree in archaeology from the University of South Africa's Department of Anthropology and Archaeology. Uh, so Nicole, without any further ado, over to you. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Uh, let me start a screen sharing um, and then we can immediately jump into the presentation. There we go. Today I'm introducing you to public archaeology, um, more specifically the case of the Mapungubwe collections located at the UP museums. To start off with, um, maybe we should just briefly go back to the definition of archaeology, which is the study of the material remains of past human communities. Research is done in a myriad of ways uh, by excavations in the field, surveys and so on, but also in the lab and increasingly archaeology is becoming an interdisciplinary um, endeavor using social sciences and also integrating exact and life sciences by means uh, of the research and an analysis process. The research results obtained from archaeological study, however, um, need to be shared. Um, this is done by means of publications, museum exhibitions and the school curriculum and this means that we need to look at uh, public archaeology because archaeology literally has a social obligation to share research results. Talking about public archaeology, it actually is a very diverse field, a subfield of archaeology itself and very diverse on its own. It includes heritage management or cultural resource management. It um, also includes community engagement and participation, which means working with the public, not only with the um, other archaeologists or direct communities associated with certain archaeological sites, but it also includes integrating volunteers um, in the research process, as well as the metal detecting community. As a result of um, archaeological research, we gain knowledge about past communities. Um, this then needs to be interpreted and presented to the broader public by means of museums, visitor centers, and uh, the archaeological sites themselves. So our public archaeology very much focuses on the communication and dissemination of research results to the archaeological and broader heritage uh, community, but also to the non-archaeological community by means of secondary and tertiary education, as well as tourism. At the University of Pretoria, we are in a position to do this. We are in a position to disseminate and present the results of research. 
by definition, museums are in the service of society. Generally speaking, we um, have an obligation to look after collections by means of their curation, conservation and storage. We also at museums continue to do research and we enable other people to perform research using uh, the collections associated with the museum. In addition, we make these collections accessible by means of education and interpretation, public engagement and exhibitions. Talking about the UP museums um, specifically, we are in charge of over 50 institutional collections. We're located in two historical buildings, namely the Old Arts and Old Marinsky buildings on Hatfield campus. And beyond the collections we exhibit inside of the museums, we also manage um, the additional um, collections that are in storage. We also have a sculpture route of public sculptures scattered throughout campus, which um, we introduce people to and which we look after, as well as paintings located in different offices and so on. So there is actually a very, very big um, yeah, task that we're dealing with. Um, but nevertheless, we are considered to be a small university museum by definition and budget. Lo being located at the University of Pretoria, the UP museums are ideally located to transfer knowledge, especially about the Mapungubwe collection, which is just one of many collections that we care for and that we manage and um, interpret to the public. We do this um, interpretation of the Mapungubwe collection specifically by means of physical tours as well as virtual tours which uh, with the COVID pandemic is becoming more and more relative, um, relevant, sorry, not relative. Um, and um, we interpret the collections of the UP museums to a very, very diverse audience, different age groups from school learners to pensioners, um, people of different cultural backgrounds, people of different abilities and disabilities. This means we have an internal audience made up of students and staff members. We also have a variety of um, classes and courses that we present relevant material to, which also can make use of the collections exhibited in the museums and those in storage for research purposes and for illustrative purposes of material being covered in um, yeah, the classroom context. We also have a very diverse external audience, ranging from domestic and international tourists to visiting academics, to staff and students from other universities, to school learners and their teachers, um, to pensioners, people with disabilities, um, the diplomatic corps even. So we um, have a very vast range of stakeholders and communities that we serve. As I mentioned before, one of the collections that we um, care for is the Mapungubwe collection. That means um, the excavated material from K2, the earlier site preceding Mapungubwe Hill, as well as Mapungubwe Hill itself and actually also research pertaining to the entire Mapungubwe cultural landscape. So it, Mapungubwe is located in the Limpopo Valley. It is two kilometers south of the Shashi Limpopo confluence. Mm -hmm. And um, it is, was declared as a World Heritage Site in 2003, owing to the fact that it is considered to be the first African state that developed in Southern Africa. The University of Pretoria has been involved with research since the rediscovery of the site in 1933. And uh, so we, um, in the meantime, have become known as the stewards of the Mapungubwe collection. This, uh, agreement was signed um, with SARA, Sandparks and the University of Pretoria in 2018. 
and the Mapungubwe collection is exhibited in the Old Arts Building, which you can see in the top image. The Mapungubwe Gallery has been in existence since 2000, and recently, uh, since two years ago, we moved the gold collection from Mapungubwe to Javad UP in order to be more publicly accessible, since the UP museums are only open during university hours and the Javad UP is also open over weekends, which means we're more publicly accessible or making the Mapungubwe collection more publicly accessible as part of the National Treasures exhibition. Now, of course, um, we also manage storage facilities where uh, further collections of um, the Mapungubwe collection, further artifact assemblages are um, stored and cared for. And we also have the only Mapungubwe archive, which records and documents all of the history of research since the rediscovery of the um, site in 1990. Um, 1933. So the Mapungubwe collection at the University of Pretoria um, is ideally located for continuing multidisciplinary research. We use this collection also for the training and teaching of students and we also make it available for student projects and uh, graduate projects and so on. We also publish about the Mapungubwe collection by means of museum publication, publications. So we um, not only make these available to academia, but it, these publications also enable us to move beyond the academic domain into the public domain, which means that visitors have something to take with them um, once they've visited us, where they can continue their learning of Mapungubwe. We make this collection publicly accessible and we continue to protect the collection, to preserve it, to conserve it, and we continue curating it for the benefit of the public. As you can see on the right hand side, this is basically what is being exhibited inside of the Mapungubwe Gallery. At this stage, we mostly focus on ceramics. Um, we are also busy working on a, a bead exhibition of trade glass beads, as well as indigenous locally made beads like ostrich eggshell and land snail beads. Um, and of course, the gold collection is exhibited at Javit, which I'll point out in a minute. But on the left hand side you can see that a vast uh, majority of the collection is not actually on display it's only a fraction that is on display so there is a lot of potential for further research and for changing out objects uh, to showcase a variety of the collection this is the javit up art center and um, on the right hand side, you can see the, um, the markup of what the display case looks like. So um, the gold collection from Mapungubwe is currently exhibited at Javit so that it is more publicly accessible as mentioned before. Also, we have the Mapungubwe archive. It is the only archive dedicated to the Mapungubwe cultural landscape. Um, it commenced in the 1930s with the rediscovery of Mapungubwe, containing a variety of historical and archaeological primary, uh, primary documents as well as excavation records. So there are over 60,000 documents in the collection of which only 3,800 at this stage have been access accessioned into the database. The oldest document dates from approximately 19, uh, 1898, and um, there are various manuscripts, excavation reports, field reports, posters, memorabilia, maps, uh, drawings, um, anything you can think of in connection with the research since the start of research associated with the Mapungubwe collection. The letter that you can see 
um, on the right hand side forms part of the correspondence documents. It is actually um, dating to 1933 and it is the letter by the von Kran family to Professor Liu Fuxia informing uh, the University of Pretoria of the discovery of Mapungubwe. So letters like these are also readily available in the documentary um, collection associated with Mapungubwe Hill. In addition, we have a myriad of uh, photographs. There's actually an incalculable amount of photographs at this stage, the oldest dating to 1933. Um, and the photographs range to current times with current research. There are also um, various um, rare aerial photographs made by the Royal Air Force. Um, there are glass negatives, there are color slides. So there is a variety of material associated with the research at Mapungubwe Hill. This, for example, is the earliest aerial photograph that we have of Mapungubwe Hill. You can see Mapungubwe Hill here in the center, and uh, you can see the wing of the aircraft. This is one of the 1933 um, aerial photographs taken by the Royal Air Force. We also have very interesting um, additional photographs, not only pertaining to the research, but also to the researchers who excavated at Mapungubwe Hill. Now the photograph on the left hand side is the earliest uh, photograph of anyone camping um, in the Mapungubwe cultural landscape. So the person bending down here as far as I know is Professor Liu Fuxia from the then history department at the University of Pretoria followed by one of the later tent camps where research about Mapungubwe Hill uh, really started going ahead. And then at the bottom over here, this is when the um, army actually lent tents to the University of Pretoria's researchers in the, I think, 1980s or 1990s. So at the University of Pretoria, we really want to make the Mapungubwe collection available. Um, to the public because it is such an important collection. As I mentioned before, it has world heritage status and it currently forms part of the school curriculum. So before the advent of COVID, most of our um, engagement with the public took part by means of physical tours. We physically offered tours to larger groups, walking them through the collections, interpreting especially the Mapungubwe collection to the public, to large school groups and so on. We also took um, disabled visitors through the collections. Um, in some of the rare cases, we actually opened up the display cases and had them um, explore one of the big Mapungubwe, one of the big belly pots by touch. And we also have various um, touch models inside of the Mapungubwe gallery or various audiovisual materials to enhance the visitor experience. And um, very rarely we were contacted to offer virtual tours. But most of the engagement with Mapungubwe occurred um, within a school context where schools contacted us, especially for the grade six curriculum to give um, additional information of Mapungubwe Hill and its associated sites. Then came the COVID pandemic and we very suddenly had to change the way we worked and interpreted the collections. So hybrid learning is becoming increasingly important. That is a combination of physical classroom teaching, tours, as well as digital means of making these collections accessible and available to the public. We still do physical tours at this stage. Um, we didn't do them for a very long period of time because the museums were closed since the end of March 2020 to um, the 1st of February 2021 when we reopened the museums to the public. So 
At this stage, physical tours are taking place with only limited numbers of people, um, only a maximum of 10 at this stage, which is the internationally accepted COVID standard for interpretation with, in museums. We um, ensure that people wear masks, that they are socially distancing. We also allow increased self-browsing of the exhibitions and collections, but our digital engagement has increased exponentially. So we offer customized Mapungubwe talks or virtual tours of the Mapungubwe collection for school learners. We also offer virtual tours and online talks for myriad of other author um, audiences. So here you can see um, just two examples of engagement and digital talks for about Mapungubwe uh, to schools grade six learners. We also um, offer talks to other audiences, as I mentioned, and over here, this is the first international talk that we offered um, to Bradley University's OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute, which is um, people, mostly pensioners or people with an advanced age, mostly 50 years and above, who um, are interested in learning about the museums and Mapungubwe specifically. So you can see that Mapungubwe is becoming internationally recognized and more and more people are interested in learning about it. There are various trends and challenges that museums in general face. Um, generally speaking, we're moving away from object-centered interpretation and museum education more towards a visitor-centered experience, offering a memorable experience so that people want to come back and learn more about collections. We need to also remain socially relevant, especially in current times. Um, we need to be socially inclusive and accessible as well. One of the problems, of course, especially as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic is funding. Funding is falling away for many, many museum institutions. We are hearing more and more about museums that are struggling to pay their staff, that are struggling to maintain their collections, that are closing their doors. Um, the Apartheid Museum is one example, a Mandela House, Robin Island, a month ago, we heard that they're struggling to um, pay their staff. So funding is, um, public funding is falling away. And uh, because of the long closure of museums, um, private funding is also becoming an issue. So we increasingly depend on funds. Luckily, the UP museums are in a very, very fortunate position in, much, um, in as much as that we are supported by the university institution itself. Then there's also, there are also other challenges that uh, come about. For example, future orientating the Mapungupwe collection. We have no idea what the future holds. But um, we do know that, um, for example, there's a new restitution and repatriation law that is coming about. And um, even before the existence of that law, we already set a rather good example of working with the local communities. In um, 2005, the first calls for repatriating Mapungubwe human remains and the human remains associated with the entire cultural landscape of uh, Mapungubwe became louder and we decided to um, listen to that call and we worked together with Sara with the local communities and in 2007 all of the human remains of the Mapungubwe cultural landscape were reburied in the cultural landscape and were repatriated there. We also want to learn more about the people who created the art and artifacts associated with Mapungubwe Hill with K2 and the other sites. Um, we need to understand who were these people, not only looking at what are the objects and how are they important, but these objects tell us a lot about the people, their circumstances, um, 
and so on um, back in um, the 13th century and earlier. At the UP Museums, we are also now um, working with Google Arts and Culture, trying to make the collections that are associated with the museums available to the public by digitizing them. By And um, the Google Arts and Culture, um, they, they approached us and they're assisting us with uh, the digitization of the museum collections and very soon um, Google Africa is going to go online and our museum collections are going to form part of the um, earliest batch of uh, collections being made accessible by means of exploring the objects themselves, by means of uh, virtual exhibitions and so on. So making collections available without people needing to travel to see them that also enables more and more people to um, it enables accessibility of the collections for research and of course we also want to make our collections more available for international and interdisciplinary research in um, addition of course, decolonization is always an issue, especially since many uh, museums were founded within a colonial context. So decolonization uh, needs to take place not only within the interpretation of the collections, but also by um, changing the way exhibitions are done, by changing the way museum collections are studied and interpreted. And this means that we really need to include more oral histories and um, yeah, local knowledge um, that is available. In order to decolonize museums, also new and alternative methods of museum education and interpretation um, are becoming more and more relevant. Um, Several years ago, the Smithsonian Institute, which is the institute heading about 20 museums or more in the USA, they developed the IPOP theory of education, which is an educational museum uh, interpretation theory. And it moves away from the traditional learning methods because it identified that people have certain affinities uh, that they, um, yeah, that they look at and that they um, shape their perceptions with. This is, uh, for example, ideas. The IPOP is literally ideas, people, objects, and the physical. So people um, who or audiences are um, basically adhered to, uh, they could be um, thinking by means of ideas. Taking the Mapungubwe collection as an example, who were these people? What were their ideas? What were, what were, how was, did their society function? Um, what were their religious um, interpretations and how did that shape their everyday life? Um, who were the people themselves? How did they live? How did they, um, yeah, was their society structured? Um, for example, was they an elite? Were they commoners? Um, how did they um, create objects? How did they um, create crops? And were they herders or were they nomads? Um, the objects themselves that were created, the technology and artistry that went into them. And finally, the physical aspect. Some people like to reenact things and that shapes their learning and education. Um, it could be reenacting and physically redoing a pot to explore how um, objects were created. So experimental archaeology is also becoming increasingly important. Audiovisual elements um, get added into education. So this is a very different type of interpreting collections to audiences and visitors. It is already being uh, applied during exhibition design and it forms part of how 
collections are interpreted to visitors during guided tours. So that is just one um, new or alternative method of interpretation, because this really shapes the way people think. And they might have an affinity to ideas, but that might then switch them um, during um, a Mapungubwe tour to understand, wanting to understand and learn more about who these people were based on the ideas that shaped their society. So Mapungubwe is a very interesting and intricate uh, collection that we can interpret to the public. We are very fortunate that it is at the UP museums and that it is so accessible for public um, interpretation and to the public, to visitors, to researchers for archeology span and so on. And that is my presentation. Thank you very much for that, Nicole. Um, I'm really excited to hear that, you know, in a, in a, let's say, we're almost into a post COVID world. Let's hope we're not going to be in lockdowns and isolation for much for, for much longer. But I think, you know, in retrospect, something good that came out of this pandemic has been the transition to more online, online lectures, online museum tours, everything going more digital. Um, so my question in this regard is, you know, in terms of your digitization of your collections, um, like a, a rough estimate, how much of your collection has been digitized? And then do you need any assistance in terms of your digitization? Do you need volunteers? Is there some way that students could be involved in this initiative? Now, digitization is a very daunting task. And we are uh, currently getting assistance and training um, from the Google Cultural Institute itself. And about three of our staff are busy with the digitization, developing um, online exhibitions and so on. That doesn't mean that we couldn't do more. There is the vast, the collections of the museum are vast. As I mentioned, Mapungupwe itself is just one of over 50 collections. So there are um, art collections, there are sculptures, there are ceramics. Um, it is a lot of work. And um, I think that if anybody's interested, they should please approach Cyan, um, Dr. Tylee Nell, who is the head of the museums, because I'm sure that, uh, you know, help will be appreciated. Um, I'm just not sure if we have funds to pay anyone, but volunteering in a museum is always a good start um, to get more, yeah, to, to start working with the collections themselves. And it might be a viable career path for many archeologists or endeavoring archeologists, aspiring archeologists, seeing as this is a student development course. Yes. Um, there um, or workshop, um, there is definitely potential for more work to be done because we are only limited staff mm -hmm. and our collections are just so big. Yes. And yes, talking about how much has already been digitized, mm -hmm. now um, looking at the Mapungubwe archive in itself, more than 60,000 documents, an incalculable amount of photographs of this. 60,000 plus documents, only 3,800 has been digitized. Of the artworks and the other collections, we're making rather good uh, progress with that, um, but there is still only a fraction that has been done. Right. Yeah, so I, I understand that the digitization, um, it's, it's not an easy or a simple process. You do need some guidance. You do need some training. It is a, it is kind of like a, a, a sub, well, almost like a sub discipline within, I guess, museum curatorship. Um, but that's not to say that students, you know, can help you carry up collections from the storerooms or, you know, help you to position objects if you're doing um, 3D modeling and, you know, stuff like that. Mm. And just the value of online collections, you know, can't be overemphasized because on my own PhD research, 
um, in the comparative study that I did with objects from our local museums, you know, that comparative study relied solely on published articles that featured images and online digital museum collections. And without those online museum collections, I wouldn't have been able to work with international objects, with objects from Japan and Egypt and Arabia. So I, I really hope that the digitization goes on and that you get some volunteers. So students, please contact uh, Ivan Nicole or Dr. Tiny now and find out where you could get involved. Um, so Pumi, do you have any questions or comments for Nicole? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very inspiring. Like my mind was just going. I would have so many questions, but I'm going to have to limit them. Um, but thank you, Mar uh, Mariette. You already like kind of touched on a question that I wanted to know about like the collections and how they are. But um, especially since like the, the recent fires that happened in UCT, I just also wanted to know like, have they been digitized? And that's the important bit now because we have stuff that's from 1930s and onwards. And you'll never get the, as you mentioning uh, there are absolutely unique con collections that are with us they're only you know once in a lifetime things the we have the only mapungubwa archive if we and god forbid that you know something like that should happen but if something happens and maybe a flooding event or a fire occurs that information is gone whatever is not digitized at that point might be lost and we're not only talking about documents, we're also talking about objects. Um, so it is so important to make these collections available electronically, digitally. Also, as Mariette, as you mentioned, with regard to research, if I had to travel to a museum um, right now in order to work with collections, it's currently rather impossible. So making these collections digitally available actually enables research and accessibility to the collections in a different way, not only physical access, but literally knowledge access. So yeah, um, basically what, what my question was leading up to was, um, because you had that letter, where you're talking about the discovery of Mapungupe. I just wanted to know, have some of those letters been transcribed, if not digitized? Um, I don't actually think they have been transcribed. Um, I don't directly work with the Mapungupe archive myself, but I know that a lot of these um, letters, the correspondence and so on, has been scanned. And a lot of these are primary materials. So even though um, they're primary materials and they many of them are handwritten that means that there's still so much potential for researchers to actually interpret them in the context that they were created in i mean 1933 this means this is even pre-apartheid we're still talking colonial context this is um after the uh, First World War, before the Second World War even, when this discovery was made. So there is a lot of potential for research, for interpretation of these collections. But what is even more important is that oral histories need to be transcribed because indigenous knowledge systems can contribute and add so much information to research um, of especially Mapungupwe. We, um, as I mentioned before, archeology span is becoming more and more interdisciplinary, not only with the social sciences, but also the exact and life sciences. Social sciences, anthropological research is becoming more and more important. Historical research, um, the information, the, the legends and the myths about Mapungubwe that every cultural group in South Africa has. Um, Mapungubwe is considered as the universal ancestor of um, the people of South Africa because, you know, they can't be there. Everybody has some story that relates to Mapungubwe, showing that the um, people, their knowledge has been filtered into various communities. And these uh, stories need to be recorded because they can shape our understanding 
of um, these past societies to a large degree. So yeah, basically, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot to, to unpack. And it's also just not only for archaeologists, for heritage specialists, for sociologists, they have a lot to dig into. And obviously, that's what we want to, to bring to the fore as well. Like Definitely. Yeah, we need, it's, it's a lot of teamwork. And, <laughs> and uh, speaking on the, the indigenous knowledge systems and just the history itself and decolonization, because those are big topics right now. And we need to also understand that um, some of these discussions have been going on for many years, but there's no actions that have been made. You don't find too much being done about it, or even maybe just a little bit of action that they do have or have done is like it's that's enough for the next 10 years but that's not okay we need to fix mm -hmm. we need to fix things we need to put things into motion it's going to be an ongoing thing until we reach that part where we can say that it's like none of the things that we have like none of the archaeological stuff none of the historical stuff is colonized we need to decolonize it we need to work on to that we need to put it into people's minds as well that this stuff is not just old it's old rubbish. It's not. These are material things that we need. These are things that help us uh, with our identity. So just to not to go any further, but just to like speak on that, we need. It's it's important to 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 look into these things to keep these topics alive and to also do actions as well with decolonizing, and absolutely the repatriations I are. More. Yeah, the repatriations <laughs> are a step forward, but we need to continue with doing that. Yes, definitely. There's a there's a lot of work that is still left to be done, and a lot of aspects of the of the collection that needs to be looked at, and you know what all these collections can tell us about uh, the ancient past. So, Nicole, thank you very much um, for your uh, presentation and for your contribution to this workshop. To the students out there listening, remember to complete the pop quiz that's associated with these with the uh, with this lecture. We like to see your engagement. So remember, go and complete, complete that quiz and keep an eye out for all the upcoming lectures. We have still a jam-packed schedule uh, full of content available to you. So Nicole, thank you once again uh, for your contribution. And we'd also like to um, give a special thanks uh, to the museum for sponsoring um, the book prizes guys we'll tell you more about those book prizes in due course keep an eye out on social media for more information about that you know really nice prizes up for grabs so don't miss out once again nicole thank you very much have a good day everyone bye, bye.